Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And for those of you who have been watching my channel for a while, then you may be experiencing a sense of deja vu because you are once again seeing the name Thomas Wyatt in the title of a video. And after all, we have already covered the Wyatt Rebellion, which threatened Queen Mary I in the early months of her reign. In that video, we looked at Thomas's life and legacy. We explored the events that resulted ultimately in his execution on the 11th of April, 1554. And I will be leaving that video linked to this one because we aren't doing a remake today. That earlier video was about the son. Today, we are going to be discussing the father. Before we jump into today's topic, I want to say a big thank you to Whirligig Games for sponsoring this video. If you are watching today's video on the day that it went live, then you are going to have just a few short hours left to support the development of Whirligig Games' new tabletop game called Molly House. For those of you that have been watching this channel for a while, perhaps you remember that I did make a video on the Molly Houses. If you don't remember, I will be leaving that video linked. Many people consider the lives of those individuals who frequented the Molly Houses to be something known as hidden history. After all, there are very few books on this particular topic, and I think that makes it easy for it to fly under many people's radars. And that's one of the reasons why I think that this game is so useful. It offers players a way in to explore and discover more about what Richter Norton calls the, quote, gay subculture in England. When you play, you will enter the world of this game as a molly. You will throw fabulous parties, cruise back alleys, and attempt to manage the danger that was posed to you by the Society for the Reformation of Manners. Will you manage to sidestep their moralising grasp, or will you turn informant? What will you learn along the way? If you are watching this video later, and so find yourself devastated that you have missed this campaign window, fear not, because Whirligig Games will have a pre-order store open as a final call for backers on December the 1st, 2023. If you would like to support the development of this game and also receive a copy of it when it launches in September 2024, please click on the link in my description box. Thanks again to Whirligig Games and Molly House for sponsoring this video. But now it is time for us to take a look at Sir Thomas Wyatt, the Elder. Thomas Wyatt was born in around 1503. He was the eldest son of Sir Henry Wyatt and his wife Anne. It is thought likely that Thomas was born at Allington Castle in Kent. This had been purchased by his father Sir Henry in 1492. Sir Henry had used some of the funds that he was in receipt of due to his favoured and trusted place at the court of King Henry VII. Sir Henry Wyatt would continue to enjoy this royal favour in the reign of Henry VII's son, King Henry VIII. Sir Henry Wyatt built bonds with his neighbours in Kent too, such as with Thomas Boleyn and his family at Hever Castle. Henry and Thomas weren't simply neighbours, they were also co-workers and not only at court. Because in 1511, they had been granted joint captaincy over Norwich Castle. Sir Henry also formed a relationship with Thomas Cromwell. And I think it would be easy to view this as Sir Henry simply falling in with the men of the fairly recently risen court faction. That the choice to forge these bonds was political rather than personal. However, Sir Henry did choose Cromwell to be one of his executors. So I think it is not outlandish for us to suggest that this might indicate that this pair, Sir Henry and Thomas Cromwell, shared a bond of trust that went beyond the merely political. No doubt, though, these were also bonds that were useful to both Sir Henry and his son, Thomas Wyatt. I would imagine that Sir Henry would have felt sure that with the right training, support and good fortune, his son and heir could do just as well, if not better, than he at court. According to Wyatt family law, as a child... 
Thomas saved his father from a lion that was being kept by the family. So, he is being presented as a hero from childhood then, and certainly this tale did apparently make it to King Henry VIII, through, I'm sure, no connivance of the Wyatt family. This is the kind of story that any family would love the king to hear of their son, as it immediately sets him apart from his peers. It makes him memorable. It's also the kind of thing that pushes a young man into the monarch's field of vision. If he was able to shine while there, then royal favour might well be his to enjoy. Thomas's evident gift for poetry was a further thing that set him apart as being special. Today, he is described as being, quote, the foremost poet of the court of Henry VIII. It is thought that Thomas was educated at St John's College, Cambridge, and although there is no evidence that he obtained or even attempted to obtain a degree from that place, the experience of studying there was likely foundational to his future creativity. Colin Burrow explains that St John's College was the chief centre of humanistic learning, where Thomas Wyatt's admiration of Seneca, Epictetus and Horace likely began. Thomas was soon ensconced at the royal court. He was there by 1515 or 1516, acting as a sewer extraordinary. This meant that he was there to serve his royal master by waiting upon him at table, and that he was doing this from his early teens. He was present and performing this particular role at the christening of the Princess Mary in 1516. A few years after this, in around 1520, Thomas was married. His wife was Elizabeth. She was the daughter of another prominent Kentish family, her father being Thomas Brooke, 8th Baron Cobham. This couple's only child, a son, Thomas Wyatt the Younger, was born not long after this marriage took place, and certainly by the end of 1521. Within a few years, Thomas and Elizabeth had clearly become sufficiently unhappy in their marriage to be estranged from one another. Elizabeth's adultery is often given as the reason for this particular rift, but I do think it's worth pointing out that Thomas also wasn't a faithful spouse to her either. I mean, down the line, he would have at least one child by his mistress, Elizabeth Darrell, This child would be born in the second part of the 1530s, and so around the same time as that's happening, Thomas's brother-in-law, George, is petitioning for Thomas to be reminded, and by reminded, I think we should probably read enforced, to provide for his sister, Thomas's wife, Elizabeth. For her brother George to take this step, I think we might assume or extrapolate that Thomas was not, at that point, providing for her, and perhaps that sounds about right. I mean, after all, they are estranged. Well, they may be estranged. She, and indeed he, may have been adulterous, but they remained married. And so, he remained financially responsible for her. Between this couple's marriage in around 1520 and George's petitioning in 1537, an awful lot had happened to Thomas, and indeed, to England as a whole. But let's travel back a few years from 1537 to 1524. In that year, we see evidence that Thomas Wyatt had played the game of court well enough to be shown preferment. Because in that year, he was made clerk of the King's Jewels. And in this role, he was answerable to his own father, who at that time was master of the King's Jewels. It has been suggested that Thomas was made clerk at this time so that he could be properly prepared, trained up, if you will, to take over from his father as master when the time came. In the end, though, it would be Thomas Cromwell that would fill that role. By 1525, Thomas Wyatt was an esquire of the king's body. Thomas was thus made one of Henry's closest servants. He had special access to the privy apartments. Thomas would wait upon his king in his bedchamber. He might be on hand to help his king dress. In addition, he would provide the king with companionship and entertainment. And through this, Thomas Wyatt enjoyed that proximity to majesty that would have made influence and reward his to claim. 
Thomas would play key roles beside his king at the court entertainments for the Christmas tide period of 1524 to 1525. He participated in the tournaments and masks and celebrations that filled that particular festive period when it was hosted at Greenwich Palace. It has been suggested by some scholars that this was the period when King Henry VIII first took a romantic interest in Anne Boleyn. Some have also suggested that at this time Henry had more than one competitor in his pursuit of her and that Thomas Wyatt was a potential opponent. It is said that he too was keen to make Anne his mistress. Historical fiction frequently presents a narrative that sees Anne and Thomas being childhood friends, that their relationship in this regard was made possible due to them being neighbours in Kent, and I think this makes it sound like Heaver and Allington shared a garden fence or something, when in reality, as we can see here, these two locations are more than eight hours' walk from each other. However, this doesn't mean that Thomas Wyatt wasn't infatuated with Anne when Henry's interest turned towards her. And if Henry's pursuit of Anne did begin, as the year 1524 turned into 1525, is it possible that he viewed Thomas Wyatt as being a real threat to him achieving what he wanted? And if so, might that mean that we should view Thomas's diplomatic missions, where he was sent out of England on one occasion, to further England's business and relations with France. He was there from April to May of 1526, and soon after, he was sent to the papal court in Rome to discuss dispensations at the start of 1527. Is it possible that, in addition to them being a sign of the faith and favour that King Henry held for Thomas, that these commissions were, in part at least, motivated by Henry's desire to put physical distance between Thomas and Anne. And certainly, Thomas's time on the continent on this secondary papal mission was unexpectedly extended. His party had travelled to Venice at the end of February 1527, and then on to Ferrara. Wyatt was granted letters of safe conduct by the Duke there. The forces of Charles V Holy Roman Emperor did not pay much attention to these letters of safe conduct when they took Wyatt hostage. They held him until a ransom of 3,000 ducats could be paid. It was the Duke of Ferrara who delivered the sum by the 1st of April 1527. And now Wyatt once again had to make his way home from Rome. He left there at the start of May. Just a few days later, on the 6th of that month, the Emperor's troops sacked Rome. After all he experienced, did Thomas Wyatt return to England, content at last to leave Anne to his king? Was it, perhaps at this point, that he was moved to write the following? Whoso list to hunt, I know where is an hind, but as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am of them that furthest come behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, fainting I follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Who list her hunt? I put him out of doubt as well as I may spend his time in vain. And graven with diamonds, in letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. No lay me tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. What we have here is a version of a Petrarchan or Italian sonnet. This poetic form, which Thomas Wyatt is often credited with introducing, if not certainly with popularising in England and at the English court, is something that would go on to be further popularised and indeed developed for the remainder of the century. I think this happens to such an extent that when most of us hear the word sonnet now, we are drawn to think of the work of an Englishman, namely William Shakespeare. It's almost as if the Italian origins of this poetic form have been in some way forgotten or overwritten in our minds. Either way, Thomas Wyatt's role in the development of English poetry should, I would argue, not be undervalued. When thinking about the poem we have just looked at, it has been suggested that the hind 
was intended to signify Anne Boleyn. This sonnet is a tale of unrequited love, and also possibly a warning against wasting time in the continued pursuit of that love. Because, we are told, when it comes to this hind, graven with diamonds in letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about, no lay me tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. No lay me tangere, touch me not, for Caesar's I am, Caesar here being King Henry VIII. Did Thomas Wyatt have Anne in mind, or was he perhaps attempting to insinuate that it was her that he was thinking of when he wrote the following riddle? A lady gave me a gift she had not, and I received her gift, which I took not. She gave it me willingly, and yet she would not, and I received it, albeit I could not. If she give it me, I force not, and if she take it again, she cares not. Conster what this is, and tell not, for I am far sworn I may not. Do you think you know what the gift is that this riddle is referring to? If you do, why not pop an emoji version of that answer into the chat or the comments now? If Henry did feel that Thomas Wyatt was indeed his love rival, it doesn't appear, at least at this point, that this resulted in there being any resentment of this subject by the monarch. Quite the opposite, in fact, because in September 1529, the king granted Wyatt a licence that allowed him to import and thus profit from French wine and woad. The following month, Henry did, however, give Wyatt another posting that would require his absence from court. Between October 1529 and November 1530, Wyatt was High Marshal of Calais, so make of that what you will. For Wyatt's part, though, this posting was clearly appealing enough, for whatever reason, for him to attempt to regain it in May 1536, which, to be fair, certainly wasn't a good month for Wyatt in England, but more on that in a moment. After his return from Calais, he was granted yet more positions of trust, such as Commissioner of the Peace in Essex in 1532, as a sign of the continued favour bestowed upon him by his king. Wyatt became ever closer to Thomas Cromwell, who was himself ascending to dizzying heights at court and also in King Henry's esteem. In October 1532, Henry, Anne and a large component of the English court travelled to Calais to meet Francis I of France, with the intention, or indeed the hope, that this French king would support Henry and Anne's future marriage and her future status as Queen of England. It is suggested that Wyatt was a part of this delegation and that the experience of being there inspired him to write the following. Sometime I fled the fire that me so brent, by sea, by land, by water and by wind, and now the coals I follow that be quent. From Dover to Calais with willing mind, lo, how desire is both forsprung and spent. And he may see that Willem was so blind, and all his labour laughs he now to scorn, meshed in the briars, that erst was only torn. On the way back from this trip, it is assumed that Henry and Anne exchanged vows before witnesses and then consummated their relationship. Within months, they had what they desired. Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon was found to be null and void. His marriage to Anne, who was by this point already pregnant, was determined to be lawful. She would be Queen of England. Following Thomas Wyatt's father's full retirement from public life on account of his failing health, the son took the father's place and acted as Eura at Anne Boleyn's coronation on the 1st of June 1533. Thomas continued to be rewarded by his king. His status and wealth became ever more secured and assured. Now, there was some unpleasantness in the May of 1534 when Wyatt was involved in a brawl that left one of the sergeants of London dead. And Wyatt spent a short spell in the fleet prison as a result of this. And it could only have been a short spell 
because around a year later, he was certainly back at liberty because he was being knighted. Sir Thomas Wyatt, as he had now become, would, however, find himself imprisoned once again, this time from the 5th of May, 1536. He was sent to the Tower of London. He was held alongside the Queen, Anne Boleyn, her brother, George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, their friends, Sir Henry Norris, William Brereton, Sir Francis Weston, and the musician Mark Smeaton. Another friend, Sir Richard Page, would arrive at around the same time as Wyatt. On the 12th of May 1536, John Hussey wrote a letter to Lord Lyle, which included the following, quote, Master Page and Master Wyatt, and presumably he does mean Sir, with regard to both of these gentlemen, are in the Tower, but it is thought without danger of life, though Master Page is banished the King's Court forever. In his next letter to him, dated to the following day, Hussey states, quote, here are so many tales I cannot tell what to write. This day, some say, young Weston shall scape, and some that none shall die but the Queen and her brother, others that Wyatt and Page are as like to suffer as the others. The saying now is that those who shall suffer shall die when the Queen and her brother go to execution. But I think they shall all suffer. If any escape, it will be young Weston for whom importunate suit is being made. Rumours swelled at home and abroad. As it was, it would be Wyatt and Page who escaped, and not Weston. It is unclear why Wyatt was seemingly suspected and imprisoned at this time. Many have pointed to his family's ties to the Boleyns as a potential reason. Additionally, comment has been made about the content of Wyatt's poetry. Perhaps it was proof that there was more than mere infatuation between Wyatt and Anne. Did it maybe show that Anne had encouraged him before or even during her marriage to the king? Was it a sign that things had gone further than flirtation? Wyatt himself would later allege that he had found himself in the tower at that point due only to the, quote, old, undeserved, evil will of Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. Although he escaped with his life, I think it would be unfair to say that Sir Thomas Wyatt was wholly unscathed by the events of 1536. One of his poems gives us an idea of what he experienced and the effect it had on him. Who list his wealth and ease retain? Himself let him unknown contain. Press not too fast in at that gate, where the return stands by disdain, for sure, circa regna tonat. This translates to, around the throne, the thunder rolls. The high mountains are blasted oft, when the low valley is mild and soft. Fortune with health stands at debate, the fall is grievous from aloft, and sure, circa regna tonat. These bloody days have broken my heart, my lust, my youth did them depart, and blind desire of estate, who hastes to climb, seeks to revert, of truth, circa, regna, tonat. The bell tower showed me such a sight that in my head sticks day and night, there did I learn out of a great, for all favour, glory or might, that yet, circa, Regna Tonat. By proof I say there did I learn, which helpeth not defence to yearn, of innocency to plead or prate. Bear low, therefore, give God the stern, for sure. Circa Regna Tonat. It seems that Wyatt is stating here that from his cell in the bell tower he watched the executions of George Boleyn, Henry Norris, Francis Weston, William Brereton and Mark Smeaton, which took place on Tower Hill on the 17th of May 1536. Anne Boleyn would be executed two days later on the 19th within the Tower Complex itself. If we consider the location of the Bell Tower cells and the most likely site for Anne's scaffold, I do think it is unlikely that Wyatt saw her die as well, but it is not impossible that he did. We also don't know why Wyatt was not executed and was ultimately instead set free. Did his good friend Thomas Cromwell protect him? 
did King Henry VIII's long affection for him work in his favour? Were the letters written in his support simply more effective? Or was he always safe? Was he imprisoned in the first place only to make a point? To show the Berlin faction and their supporters that these relationships they had once enjoyed, these loyalties they had rested on, were now dangerous both to their life and their place. Sir Henry Wyatt, his health poor, had learned of his son's arrest and the potential charge of treason. On the 11th of May 1536, he wrote to his king and also to his friend Thomas Cromwell to thank them for sparing his son. Now, Thomas would not be released for a few months, but evidently his father is now sufficiently confident that his son is going to be safe to write these missives, or perhaps he simply had faith that this would be the case. On the 10th of November in that same year, 1536, Sir Henry would succumb to his ill health and die. Thomas was his heir. Wyatt was out of the Tower of London by October 1536, which is around a month before his father's death, and he was rapidly returned to a place of both prominence and evident trust. He was allowed to take on his ailing father's office as steward of Connorsborough Castle, and in that role, in addition, he was commissioned to provide 200 men to help put down the Pilgrimage of Grace. He was also made Sheriff of Kent, Then, in the following year, Wyatt was sent to the court of the Emperor Charles V. He had been given the incredibly difficult diplomatic task of attempting to smooth relations between Charles V and King Henry VIII. This task was so difficult that I would understand if people saw it as a further punishment of Wyatt rather than a reward or a sign of trust. But nevertheless, this is an incredibly prominent position It is one that does need somebody who can be trusted, despite how difficult and indeed painful it would prove to be. Because Charles V by this point had some pretty negative feelings towards the monarch, Henry VIII, that had set aside his aunt, Catherine of Aragon, disinherited his cousin, Mary, and denied the authority of the Pope. All the negotiations for potential treaties and marriages would come to nothing. Indeed, Wyatt's work over there would frankly achieve very little. Nevertheless, he remained at this work for the next two and a half years. And perhaps as time went on, he did become increasingly desperate to make something worthwhile happen so that these years weren't wasted, so that he could return home. Either way, I do think he might have started taking some risks. Wyatt's various attempts to make something worthwhile happen would ultimately also generate distrust in him from multiple angles. Colin Burrow writes that, quote, Henry is supposed to have thought that Wyatt was more the emperor's ambassador than his own. There were allegations that Wyatt was attempting to orchestrate a meeting with Cardinal Pole. It was said that Wyatt had begun to hope that King Henry would die. However, Cardinal Pole and his supporters suspected that Wyatt had plans to assassinate Pole by poison. Any ambassador who is this distrusted is frankly of little use to anybody. And on top of this, it was an expensive business being abroad as an ambassador and Wyatt's debts at home were mounting. I imagine that Sir Thomas Wyatt was probably very relieved when he was recalled from his ambassadorial duties at the end of April 1540 and no doubt was happier still to be back at home by May 1540. His relief if that is what he felt, was, however, short-lived, because his colleague, friend and possible protector, Thomas Cromwell, was arrested in the June of that year. Cromwell was soon found to be treasonous and was sentenced to death. It is said that Wyatt accompanied Cromwell too and witnessed his execution on the 28th of July, 1540. It is reported that on this occasion, as Cromwell prepared to die, that he turned to Wyatt to say farewell, and also to ask him to pray for him. By the start of 1541, Wyatt's enemies felt they had enough to make a move against him. They reported to King Henry that while he was on his ambassadorial mission, Wyatt had sought out contact with Cardinal Pole, someone who King Henry utterly hated by this point. Additionally, It was alleged that Wyatt had been imagining and indeed compassing Henry's death and so Wyatt was arrested and taken to the Tower of London on the 17th of January 1541. 
A few days later, an inventory was taken of Wyatt's property and goods. His creditors were satisfied. All of this makes it look very like Wyatt is about to be executed at this point in time. Wyatt would pen a defence of himself, and in it he asserted that he was no traitor. In March 1541, I'm sure to everyone's surprise, perhaps even to Wyatt's, he was released. If the Spanish ambassador is to be believed, this release was achieved following the intercession of King Henry's young queen, Catherine Howard. In the next month, April 1541, Wyatt was put in charge of a force numbering 300 horse in Calais. Grants of land, new position and perks were soon being loaded upon him too. On the 3rd of October 1542, Wyatt received another commission. He was to meet with the Spanish envoy and then after this he was to travel to collect the Earl of Tyrone and then conduct him to meet with King Henry. However, following his meeting with the Spanish envoy, Wyatt, who was already struggling with his health, reportedly contracted a fever. He died just a few days later and he was buried at Sherborne Abbey in Dorset on the 11th of October 1542. So what do you think of Sir Thomas Wyatt, of his poems, of the various accusations that were levelled against him, of the danger he experienced and how he managed to escape that danger on so many occasions? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video, but I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that does boost the engagement and the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube does push it out, and that helps us to grow this community. As we have been talking about Wyatt, what about an emoji that either represents a poet, a politician, or a traitor? Why don't you pick which one you think most fits Wyatt, and put that either in the comments or the chat now. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do share it with your friends. In fact, if you like my channel in general, let some pals know about it. You can tell me that you like this particular video by hitting the thumbs up and please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, have a check. Make sure YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear so that YouTube, they claim, will tell you when I have next uploaded and indeed when I am next planning to go live so we can talk about the history news, which I know you're not going to want to miss. We do, of course, now have a failsafe. You can head over to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com. It's going to be linked. And then make sure that you add your email into my mailing list so that I can let you know what I'm up to and what I'm uploading and when I'm going live, all of that good stuff. I hope that you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.